technology willing. Uh, right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our second session on the Digital Skills for Collaborative OER Development course. Uh, as I indicated last week, uh, this particular instance we didn't advertise too widely because I wanted really to focus on supporting folk who are working on the assembly of the OERU first year of uh, first year of study. But we do have uh, a number of you know open participants, so that's always good, and everyone is most welcome. So just by way of introduction, I see we have one or two uh, folk who weren't with us last week. So a quick round of introductions, I think, would be in order. Uh, my name is Wayne. I work at the OER Foundation. Um, uh, my daytime job is, you know, really helping implement the OERU. Uh, my evening job is I'm a UNESCO ICDE chair in OER, so I spend most of my time trying to open source education. So I'm just going to uh, go around the room in terms of the order I have in front of me. Uh, Christine, if you uh, would like to give a um, quick introduction. <clears throat> yes. Um, well, I'm I'm from Montreal, and um, I'm a consultant, uh, doing some writing and design. And uh, I've lived in New Zealand for six years, so that's how I know a lot of uh, these wonderful people. Um, and um, I'll be working on uh, two of the micro courses about uh, management. Yeah, the principles of management course. Yes, Christine, we we really pleased to have you on board. Thank you. Uh, Next in line, uh, Dave Lane, my partner in crime. In Christchurch. Yes, so um, I'm Dave Lane, based in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, formerly from the US. My day job is uh, working as the open source technologist for the OER Foundation alongside Wayne. Um, I'm helping to make the systems that we're building all of this OER stuff on tick and ideally make them something that OER uh, U partners can also adopt uh, with minimal hassle um, and just trying to make all of this um, community built software work for people. Um, it's been an exciting challenge. Uh, outside of my day job, I am the president of the New Zealand Open Source Society, so it all kind of falls into place. Uh, and I'm involved in Creative Commons. Um, I, I, I'm on the advisory uh, group for Creative Commons Aotearoa New Zealand uh, and I get up to a lot of other things beside that but uh, those are the most important ones so I'm excited to be here um, I'm actually working on uh, learning more about learning um, because my background is technical rather than education uh, so I understand the technical bits of what we're doing but um, I'm keen to learn more about pedagogy and uh, learn from you all as um, most, of the, most of you I believe are educators so I'm keen to See how you all proceed with things. There we go. Thank, thanks, Dave. Um, and uh, let me hand over to uh, Fahad, our a, a representative from one of our platinum tier partners. So, right, right. Can you, all hear me? Can you all hear me clearly? Great. Yep. Yes. Um, so, uh, greetings, everyone from Vancouver. Uh, very excited to be here, and I will be co-developing the introduction to psychology course with Rajiv Jangiani. I, I don't think he's with us right now? No, I don't think uh, Rajiv has uh, joined us yet, I'm, and I'm not sure if he's popping in, but... Yeah, I think uh, I talked to him about 40, 45 minutes, so I think he'll try to try to make it. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I've uh, I worked with Rajiv and, and Gail Morong at TRU, developing the uh, research methods course, the second year course for TRU uh, Open Learning, uh, which is also a contribution to the OERU. Uh, so a little bit experience there working with Wiki Educator and uh, these open collaborative tools. Um, and now uh, very excited to work on the Introduction to Psychology course, in particular because it's a very high enrollment course offered around the world. Um, so very, very exciting. Yeah. Well, I have to say, Fahad, we, we, the, at the OERU, we are incredibly excited about the Psych 1 course because, as you point out, it's, you know, it's a top 10 uh, it is one of the top 10 most popular courses of the world. And so it's really uh, great that uh, you guys are doing this in the open. So we're very excited. Yeah. Great, great. So, so let me move on to uh, my colleague Cameron in Canada. 
Okay, apparently I can't figure out how to unmute my mic. Hi, everyone. Um, I know Wayne from um, back in the day when I worked um, in New Zealand as well. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so um, Wayne and I worked together at Otago Polytechnic. And before that, I was at um, Lincoln Uni. Uh, my day job now is pretty much the opposite of open. Um, I work in a... I work in a commercial e-learning, learning and development shop. Um, it's it's really fun, and I'm learning a whole lot of things that I wouldn't get to do in a lot of other places. But um, everything's proprietal, everything's locked down, and we work with really, really big companies. And that's fine. I mean, it makes perfect sense for a commercial environment, but it's nice to dip my toes back into this and higher ed again. So that's where I'm at. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Cameron. And uh, Lenora, glad, glad you could join us again this week. Thanks, Wayne. And um, I am, um, I was actually involved in OERU, uh, bringing a team together at a college here in Northern Alberta. And now I'm working um, just on my own kind of independent projects and trying to keep up with you. So I really apologize. Sometimes I'm just, I really am going to be lurking, I think, from here on in to try to keep up. I'm so amazed at all of this. So uh, you guys are amazing. Looking forward. We welcome lurkers. Um... We're, we're an open shop, so anybody that just wants to take a peek and sip and dip as we're moving along is most welcome. All right, moving on. Well, I enjoy it. I'm really glad this. Thanks, thanks, Lenora. And hey, Gail, great, great to see you here. Hi there, everyone. Uh, I'm Gail Morong. I work at Thompson Rivers University, so I'm in my office right now. Spend a day at a conference, run over here to log on on time. Um, I was fortunate to be at the launch of the whole OERU initiative uh, here at Thompson Rivers a couple of years ago. I was part of um, a course development team that worked on the first, one of the, the early prototypes for the OERU. Things have come a long way since those days, that was back in 2012. Uh, worked with Farhad and Rajiv on the psych, what was it called? I forget the whole Two name. One, one, one. Experimental Research and Psychology course. Uh, very fortunate at Thompson Rivers to have folks like Owen DeVries and Brian Lamb and quite a few really strong advocates, I would say, in the open movement. Very, they're my mentors. So happy to be part of this group. Like Lenora, I think I'll be looking. I'm just so busy. I'm going to be dipping in and out and trying to keep up. Thanks, thanks, Gail. I, th I think you progressed from uh, sort of a, a supporter to one of the community leaders, particularly on the learning design side. So it's, it's, it's great to have you on board. And uh, to my good friend and colleague, Randy. Uh, hi, I'm Randy at Fisher. Uh, I've been involved, been involved in OER since 2007, maybe 2008. Um, I just, I just keep it. I'll be working on the principles of marketing course, and um, yes, I guess that's sort of it. Uh, my day job, text uh, uh, like this. My night job, I walk dogs and I keep my wife happy. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> There you go. I'm, I'm just uh, attempting a screen share here to see if that's coming through. Uh, in theory, you should be seeing the screen share. Yeah. Great. Okay, just um, just a quick rundown uh, of you know kind of uh, where we've come from on the course. Right. If you look on the, the syllabus page, so the first uh, week and, and and a bit is really about you know setting up the environment. Uh, you know, having a look at, you know, how the wiki works um, and uh, starting to think about what a course development and design would look like. So then the first phase is really about thinking about a design, right? Um, and um, we had to look at the storyboarding. I'm just, I think so. I'm just going to mute one or two mics here because I'm getting a bit of a feedback echo here. Uh, I appreciate it. If, if you're not speaking, if you can just mute, uh, mute your uh, microphone so that I avoid the, the echo loop. And then we had a session on looking at storyboards, so all really thinking about the prospects of design. And now we're at the phase where we're actually going to start implementing stuff. 
so this is the doing part of the uh, the course where we actually start uh, the building uh, components of a learning pathway. Um, what I thought would be useful for us to uh, have a look at uh, today would be uh, examples of some of the planning documents and how they all slot to, uh, together and how we're going you know, to develop OERU courses. And then also one or two tips about uh, you know, tricks of the trade, if you will, uh, when you know, setting up a course outline, uh, because that's really what this course is about. Uh, as, as you will know, we work with uh, generating course outlines, which look something like this. Um, a course outline is essentially a bullet list of the individual pages that go up to make a course site. And we have technologies on our end that uh, produce a professional looking uh, WordPress site. So that's really what the course is about. And so today I thought I'd just give one or two tips uh, about the, the outline page. Uh, so to avoid, you know, kind of making the mistakes I've been making over the years in when trying to set these things up. That's more or less what I, I had in mind. Um, let me just quickly open the floor. If you had any specific questions at this stage or anything specific you would like us to cover today. Um, um, here, just a quest question. Um, uh, Wayne, I saw, I saw I note, uh, a, con a conversation between you and Irwin about the tech team at Sailor doing some stuff, stuff being magic behind the scenes to import content into the wiki, I guess. So I, 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 if you could just kind of kind of update on that and let us know how that might affect our work. Uh, sure, Randy. A good question because I had posted on uh, one of the development groups, the uh, MVP task force group, that we have some uh, backups that Sailor has sent us. So I'll update you on that as well. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Uh, any other questions or specifics that you would be keen for us to cover? All right, uh, let me get moving then, um, and I mean, I'll give, I'll, I'll stop along the way, and um, so if there are any questions, uh, happy to help out. So I think a, a good place to start would be to uh, perhaps just have a look at the, the sort of the generic structure of uh, the planning pages that we use for OERU developments. Uh, you will appreciate that uh, most of our developments, the, the, the development team, are literally spread across the world, working in different time zones. Uh, we have different, you know, people with different skills coming to the table, and so how we keep all of these conversations together are through the planning pages in the wiki. And so, the most important planning page for any course development is this course planning page uh, that we use. And for each of our course developments, there would be a planning page, uh, which is the home page for you know everything we do around the development. I mean, this is an example of the Creating Sustainable Futures uh, planning page. It typically gives uh, a list of the people who are involved. Um, we have for these courses a, a very high-level Gantt chart. Uh, it's been my experience that if you uh, use these project planning methodologies with Gantt charts uh, to try and uh, uh, you know, plan the detail of any project, you end up spending more time keeping the Gantt chart up to date in actually getting any of the work done. So the approach that we, we use here at the OERU is really just to have a very high level sort of overview of you know, the schedule of the project, so to speak. Uh, because with any open design and development, there are a lot of uh, dependencies. And then to try and keep track of dependencies in Gantt charts, uh, you know, kind of doesn't uh, work well. So our Gantt charts are really quite simple. I mean, in this particular case, we're moving through the design phase here, which you'll see is blue. Um, that's really about setting up the planning pages in the wiki, um, you know, finalizing the blueprint, and that's the first phase of the project. And this particular project uh, actually has four uh, micro courses because it's in the New Zealand context. Um, our courses are a little bit longer than they are in North America. So we have four micro courses that we're working on. So you'll see the one, two, three, four micro courses. And then the last phase of the development is the, the quality review where we, you know, we just do a couple of final checks. So 
this is uh, you know, intended here to help folk uh, just get a high level overview of the schedule. And of course, being a wiki, um, any of these uh, components can be changed. So how the system works, this is a bit of a, a job, it's a bit of JavaScript, it's a JavaScript widget, which actually reads the data that is in this table below. So if you wanted to change, you know, a target date uh, uh, for a particular uh, activity, you, you, one would just edit it here in this table and, you know, you save it as you do with all, all you know, wiki edits and it will then just update that visualization of the Gantt chart. But as I've said, uh, other than just a high level overview of what we're trying to achieve, that's where our Gantt charting stops uh, because I, it, otherwise it just gets too, too complicated. So that's what that is about. Um, so a question you might have in your mind, well, you know, how do we go about, uh, you know, sort of the day-to-day -day activities and the things that are being done in these various projects uh, and, you know, trying to get a sense of you know, the interdependencies. And the way we manage in interdependencies is through the integration of intelligent agents. And intelligent agents are people like you and me that have the intelligence to understand what interdependencies are. And the technologies we're using, we're actually experimenting with this for uh, the first time in our round of projects, are, uh, is this CAN board. You, you may have experience of using something like this uh, yourselves in the past, um, like something like Trello. But basically what this is, is a, a board uh, where we've got little cards that have information about the key activities. And uh, these cards can be moved across as the pro project progresses. So um, here's the list of things we're wanting to get done on this particular project. Now, when we start on the work, it gets moved across to the doing column. Um, I'm curious to know, if, is that showing for you as I move the card across? Yes. Okay, good. I just wasn't sure how the JavaScript would interact with this um, desktop sharing um, until, you know, when it's all, almost done. So that's more or less how it works. The other thing which is uh, useful to know is these cards are color coded with the same colors we were using. So the blue is, you know, for planning. Uh, the red is for the development. The uh, orange is for the review process. And it's it's easy to remember if you actually editing a card, we've set this up, if you need to add a label, um, you know, you just click on whatever the appropriate label is. So that's more or less how it works. Um, again, uh, it keeps an accurate history of everything that's done, so you can't break anything. My only request is for uh, OERU folk that are working on their CAN boards not to do your practice cards on this on on this CAN board because other, otherwise we're going to end up with a huge archive of of cards we're not actually using. So what I have set up is a a, a practice board. Uh, I'll can send you the link to that if you want to have a play with how these uh, cards work and filling them out. Um, you you can do that on the practice board, um, and so you can you know, just have a play and get a sense for how this works. Uh, there are a couple of other useful features. We don't have to go into all the detail now, but you, we could, for example, uh, indicate uh, uh, added an additional tags. So, for example, like an urgent tag, which would be things that are urgent in terms of getting done now. And we've got this ability to filter. So you can filter by any tag you want. So you can say, well, okay, what are the urgent things that need to be done? Um, and on this course, uh, at the moment, there aren't any urgent things that require attention. So, to just give a high-level overview. The other thing which is quite useful with these CAN boards is uh, the dis any discussions that need to take place uh, can actually be submitted on the card itself. So, if you open up the card, uh, there is opportunity for you know, anybody to comment on what they're doing or if they've got a question, it can just be done here. And then everybody who's participating in the project has got a transparent record of, you know, where the discussion is at. So just by way of introduction, um, the best way to uh, see how this works is to actually play with the technology. So uh, what, 
Uh, I just have a question about this because um, I had made a comment in one of the forums. I don't know. It's it's kind of confusing, but there are a lot, a lot of moving parts in terms of the tool, tools. Yeah. This particular tool, a better word, why are we using this as opposed to, you know, documenting things in the, in the wiki? So um, the, the purpose of this tool is to keep, uh, you know, for day-to-day -day activities that are here and now, uh, that we want to see the progress of the project, we use this tool. Uh, but of course, you're free to add uh, comments in the wiki. The, the most important thing with uh, with any of these developments is that there's a transparent record somewhere uh, of what is happening. So uh, the best advice I can give is, uh, if one of the, uh, these activities is, you know, is a short-term activity needs to be done here and now, a couple of folk are involved. We use the planning board uh, for those uh, for those kinds of activities. Uh, the substantive planning, uh, you know, takes place in the wiki. But again, Randy, you, uh, use what works for you. Uh, if it if it's recorded transparently and you're more comfortable with record, recording your you know day to day activities in the wiki, that's fine. Can, can I just say something, Wayne, quickly about that? Um, we're very conscious of the fact that every time we introduce a new technology, it creates a bit of a cognitive overhead for everyone to um, to come to grips with. And uh, the the big the big question is: Do we think that the tool actually provides a new, a better way of looking at things, an interface that is more intuitive for people in some way that that allows them to grasp the big picture more more rapidly or more completely, things along those lines, and to a certain extent, these tools are things that are that we're experimenting with to see whether they actually appeal to people uh, and and do lend value that that using a single tool, for example, like just the wiki, might not. Um, so, by all means, give us feedback on on these tools uh, as we use them um, to see whether you think they do add sufficient value to be worth that overhead. Um, but but basically, our our goal is to. Um, conservatively introduce these things when we think they, they're likely to be of value, and then, of course, we have to verify that that's the case by talking to you. I just want to just uh, reset that, Dave. I, I, I think it's a really good point, and as I get high, and I guess I, I guess I just get more into it, to it, then I can see more immediately at relevant tool to my work. As I'm at the front end, and I see this dizzying array of, of moving cards, cards you know, it's like, like it is it is really um, overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, in in the beginning, it, it it can be a bit confusing. But hey, Randy, we're here to uh, help navigate some of that confusion. Um, that's that's what we're here for. Um, and because there are different lenses and perspectives of of the project, there's a perspective from an individual course development, but then there's also the perspective of uh, how individual courses are fitting into the bigger MVP picture. So these are the uh, current projects that are under development, right? Um, and different pe people have got different roles in these different projects. Uh, some, some folk are working across multiple projects, others are just working on one project. And, and so we need, we, we need ways in, in keeping an up-to-date picture of the total development, um, depending on where uh, you know, you, you're sitting within the projects. So uh, at the level of an individual uh, course development, um, let's say uh, your principles of marketing, right? You will have a, a landing page, which has got your um, sort of uh, Gantt chart and high level overview. The actual planning documents that you're working with, there'll be a design blueprint, right? Uh, if you want, we, uh, the, the is a CAM board available for you. Um, and because the, of the fact that each of these technologies keeps a detailed edit history, we will know where, when changes have been made and, and, and people will be able to follow this. But what we're attempting to do is given that you know, the scale of the project that we're working with is to try and have some consistency of the, the main tools that we're using. So one are the planning pages in the wiki and this more dynamic uh, Kanban. 
and the community lists that we have. Wayne, uh, yeah. I have a question. <clears throat> sure. So will we each be given a Kanban that starts with the to-do? Are we all given that? And as things get done, you'd like us to move them over? Or are we supposed to make that first column of to-do? Yeah, it's both, of, it's, it's both of the above. It's a good question, uh, Gail. Um, I will set up a, a Kanban structure for you like this, which will have the columns to do, doing, almost undone. Uh, it just so happens uh, you're the uh, your project is the last one. <laughs> I just haven't had a chance to actually get the Kanban set up yet. But I will set that up and sort of the main activities that we're working on at the moment will be there. But each okay. of us, as, 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 as an open project, any activity that arises that you want to put on the board that you're working on, you put it on the board. Because um, the purpose of uh, these, these tools are so as if anybody comes in at any time, we'll be able to see where we're at uh, with the project. It also has an advantage that anybody that comes in later uh, let's say, I mean, perhaps there's a subject matter expert at some later time that comes in and you know, helps us out with reviewing. I mean, we don't know these things because it's an open project, right? They will at least have a, a history of everything that's happened to date um, so that they can actually get up to speed because it's been recorded. And this is one of the lessons we've learned from open source software development is that keeping a public and transparent record of where things are at uh, facilitates and enables anybody to come on board at any time. Um, I have a question about the, the history. So if I move a card, uh, I, I finish some particular thing, like we finish a meeting and I move it over, is the tool keeping a record of the date so that you know what happened or what was done, but you also know the date Yes. That it was completed? Yes, it does. Is it keeping that behind the scenes? I'm not seeing a date on anything. Um, I was, I'm, I'm trying to scroll down. I've got a bit of lag on my sh machine at the moment. It's not letting me scroll. But here at the, the bottom right-hand side of the screen, there is a... Uh, oh, hang on. Wait. Here we go. This maybe uh, it's not coming through. Uh, it's just not showing on my screen at the moment. But you'll see there's an activity... Uh, record which will say this card was moved to that column at that time by this person. Okay. Um, so you, you can go back in, uh, in terms of history to see what was done in the past. That's all there. But the most important view is actually the current view that you see uh, because that's the current state of the project. And so typically one will see, well, okay, this is where we're at. These are the things we're working on. And then I can, you know, sort of go a bit deeper and see what is happening uh, on each of the individual cards. It's quite intuitive. Once you've done it once or twice, it uh, all falls into place. Uh, and I, I have to say, uh, keeping rec uh, up-to-date records of a live project using a Kanban is actually easier than doing it in a wiki. Uh, but, but both methods are, are acceptable. I mean, it's really about using what works for you. Um, because uh, as long as you know we, we've got the records, um, that's fine. I would say that this is serves one purpose. Done. It's like a checklist where, where things are at. But in terms of making notes about about why why are we still doing A or what's the problem with B or. I think the wiki notes are useful too, to put a date, met with so and copyright, working on something or searching for this or problem yes. to be solved. Like that conversation is important too, to understand why did this take so long? And you know, what, what um, barriers are we meeting as we try to develop? Because that's where we could learn and improve. Oh, absolutely, um, Gail, you, you've hit the nail right on the head. I can see that you've uh, done one of these developments before using the wiki, and you're absolutely yep. right. Um, um, all all, all those, that documentation is, in fact, um, 
Let's see if we can find that. At any rate, you, you'll see on the, the planning page, um, we typically incorporate uh, the dates for meetings. Yeah. And so all those kinds of conversations, the meetings we have, we, we, we've got that record. So you're absolutely right here. So no changes with regards to that. <laughs> any, yeah. any other questions? Okay. The only other bit of uh, technology that we, we use is a, a standard uh, discussion forum. Sorry. Uh, Fahad, sorry, you had a question? No, Please go it's ahead. Cameron. Oh, it's Cameron. Cameron. Unless Fahad was speaking at the same time as me, and if he was, that would be typical of me, and I apologize. Um, I was just <clears throat> going to point out to Gail that one of the things I was going to try and send a link. There is note taking in, um, I find the Caban basically functions exactly like Trello. Um, but a little bit nicer. There is note taking on each card. If you were to click on a, one of the cards, um, there's a place to put activity and notes. Uh, okay. But I, but so I, I, I think that I think the documentation works better on the wikis for for bigger projects. I think Wayne's point about the um, having worked with both and losing my mind in both. Um, I think that that. What Randy was also saying is that, and Wayne said, was that it's, I think it's about um, suitability for the project. I think it makes a lot of sense, these ones for shorter term intense things. Whereas like if I was building an organization, I wouldn't do it through here. And if I was doing a suite of courses, I wouldn't do the overarching planning in something like this, but I can totally see doing it um, a course or a couple of micro courses in here because it keeps it all in one self-contained place. If that makes sense. And there's also the thing is, is that there's an archiving system within this. And so um, you don't lose it when it's done, done. So that's the only thing that I was thinking. Yeah. So Cameron, question, is there a word limit for your comment box? How much can I write in there? Can I write um, like over time, a few different comments about a particular issue? Hang on. So, uh, good, good question. I think Cameron's summary is, is, is a good one. Um, you know, if it's a short focused activity, um, like, for example, finish the blueprint, right? Yeah. Um, the Kanban is a good place to do that. But the, the more uh, um, expanded discussion of the actual blueprint, which is a more important document, that should be in the wiki. Uh, Gail, to your techni specific technical thing, I just tried putting... Um, about a page worth of Word document into one comment, and yes. it worked. Um, the, the only thing that I would say, and I, I'm, I don't want to hijack this, the other thing I would say is that separating them into separate um, activity comments would be really, really good um, because what happens is that every time you update a comment, and I'd have to check it, but this is what I've seen in Trello, every time you update a comment, it redoes the timestamp. And so you lose that historical um, notion. Whereas if let's say I was making a comment on a card and they were like progressive, like, hey, I, I, I broke something. And then, yeah, um, Dave just put a link to where I've been just testing that. Um, so every time I make a comment, it timestamps it. If I keep updating the same comment, it retimestamps it to whenever I changed it. So we can't really see the progression. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess the reason I was asking if it could all go into one comment box, I didn't realize that you can have many comments to the same card because then there would no, be no need to put one big long. I was trying to figure out if I want to say comment on a card and then comment another time on the same card, is there a different activity uh, box that would be available to me for a second yeah. comment? I've got, um, if you go on that link that Dave just sent, um, I put, um, I'm, yeah, over on the side, there's test to cam from Cameron. Right. Um, okay, I'm up so, to so, three so or me, four. So Cameron, just the, what might be uh, a challenge for Gail is she might not be registered on your Cam. Um, 
Okay, yeah. no, it was that test one. But in any case, I just put like a series of them. And right now it says five minutes ago, a few seconds ago, a few seconds ago. But I noticed that like um, over on the side in the activity, Wayne added um, Farad uh, 16 hours ago. Um, and then Wayne added Steve Henry two days ago. So there is that kind of granularity of, of history. So. Yeah. Okay, I I'll experiment with it. I just don't know the tool, but I I I'll try it out. Thank you. Yeah, and Gail, you'll see it's actually quite intuitive. Um, you know, if, if, if you're writing a Word document in the comment on the camera, it's probably too long. <laughs> yeah, no. No, 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 no. I I understand. The, the piece, yeah. you see, because I've made these courses, I know that solving any one issue does not take... To you, it looks like this is something to do, and then it's done. Between to do and done, there is so much that went on. So many conversations, issues, things we had to solve. Farhad knows yep. this. So yep. I'm just wanting to figure out, will I be able to document here or where? Oh. I'll have to play and figure out where's the best place to tell the story. It's a, it's, it's a very good point. Um, the way I do it, Gail, is uh, when I'm working on a card and there's a longer story, what I will have is I'll just include the link to the wiki page where that conversation is taking place. Mm -hmm. Got you. Um, this is a, this is a random, sorry about, about my lack of phones here, but I just want to, to Gail, your point a moment ago, um, when I've done e-learning pro projects that... Um, Activity called stakeholder liaison is the number one reason why projects are delayed. All those reasons that you, you, I you, um, you know, getting somebody to sign to sign off, get material, all all that stuff. Number one reason why projects never finish on time or rarely finish on time. Time. Yeah, and and Randy, that's a good point, and I think one of the significant differences between our open model and traditional closed projects is the the ethos that exists within an open development is rough consensus and running code. Uh, and what that means is uh, those folk who are sitting around the table uh, taking decisions move the project forward in terms of implementation, getting it done. Uh, we don't have uh, eons of sign off kind of in the open environment. But I do appreciate that there is the interface of this open kind of OERU environment and the internal um, uh, sort of the internal liaison with our internal institutions. But you must remember all, all the courses that we are working on, uh, bar one or two, uh, will not be assessed in your own organization. So you don't have to worry about the sign offs. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, Wayne, if I could just point out one quick thing about this tool, which uh, I haven't, I, I'm, I'm interested to try out, but this um, this we can platform, which we have implemented an instance of that, that's what plan.oer.org is, is actually a real time collaborative environment, which should mean that if multiple people are looking at this creating sustainable futures, um, uh, we can board at the same time. If I move something on my screen, you should see it update in real time on yours as well. So it's one of those things that if we're actually intensively engaging in a, in a mornings, what we would refer to in the programming world as a hackathon or something like that, um, where we're all working together on something, you can see things moving around um, in real time. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a very new technology. Um, that's allowing this all to happen, which is quite exciting from a programmer's point of view, but um, hopefully it has some useful uh, uh, implications from a um, working efficiently point of view as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point, Dave. And, and, to, and to be fair, this is the first time we're trying it with our, our, our developments and um, you know, we will assess how well it works, right? Um, but we are also in a different phase of our development. I mean, in the past, there were like two or three courses. Uh, this this year, up until September, we're looking most probably at 15 live developments across the network. 
So it's uh, an, an order of scale uh, bigger than we've done in the past. So I'm looking forward to, to the work I've done so far with the teams. It's it's worked well for me, uh, and it'll be good good to see how it works for you as well. Yeah, give us the feedback. Okay, so any other uh, any other quest? Any uh, other tool? I just wanted to point out is we we have a a group mailing list, right? Uh, for all all our projects now, just if if, if you think uh, in your own organization, right? You've got an internal mail server, uh, and you typically have groupings for different categories of staff in your own organization. So you might have a a mail list for directors, or you might have a mail list list for academic board and for the executive managers and then one for all staff and uh, you know most organizations have those internal lists which makes it easier to communicate internally you must remember we are spread across th you know 30 plus institutions uh, from six different regions of the world we don't have uh, one one place where we can or one mail server where we can do those kinds of uh, consultations and collaborations so the way that we do it here at the OERU is we use this tool called groups.oeru. And uh, your view would be different to my view because I'm involved in possibly more groups than you're involved with. But these are all the groups that I'm uh, conversing with and uh, interacting with. Um, there uh, are, are what, private groups is not really a good description, but it's you know for individual course teams. Uh, if you need to have your own communication list, we can set that up for you. Uh, but if you're working on a team of two, um, it may not be necessary. But you're working on a team of five people, it becomes important because uh, for folk like myself, I trying to remember who is engaged with which project is a challenge, right? Um, so that's why we use these lists. And one of the important groups. Uh, for the OERU implementation year is this MVP task force. So key leaders in the OERU community plus every consultant that we have and academic that is working on a current course for minimum viable product is part of this list. And you uh, will have received a notification of the first meeting of the MVP task force that I believe is taking place. This, uh, uh, and again, this is what makes things interesting and complicated. Uh, because we work across 24 time zones, I have to schedule two meetings for every meeting that takes place. Uh, because, you know, to accommodate the folk from Europe and Africa and the other folk from Oceania and North America. So in keeping these communications all together, we use these tools. Um, the other advantage of this particular tool is you can actually respond from your email client if you want to. Uh, most academics actually just prefer using email, but if you send it to the correct address of the group, it'll go to everybody. But at the same time, there's also a web record of all the conversations so that anybody coming into the project would be able to see, well, okay, you know, what has been said uh, in the OERU task force to date, um, you know, all those communications are there. So here we go all the communications from the MVP task force. It's also searchable. So that, that just helps with uh, keeping track of all the records. So your project may or may not have one of these lists, uh, depending on how, you know, how many people are involved. But if you do want to have a separate emailing list for your particular project, just give me a shout, we'll set it up. Dave, I don't know if you wanted to say anything specific about uh, some of the other advantages of the tech. Uh, well, I should point out it is a, it is an open source product, so so um, yeah, it, it may or may not be of interest to people. But um, the uh, the key thing with it that everyone should be aware of is if you send an attachment to the list, you're welcome to do so. But what will be what will happen is uh, if you send an attached file to your to any of the particular lists the attachment will be pulled off of the email that you have sent and rather than having it on sent to all of the recipients of the email which could potentially number in hundreds and in, in our case i think probably none of the lists are that big yet but it could could get that way in the future um what it, what the online groups system does is it stores it 
on a central server and it instead puts a link to the the resource that you've uh, attached to the email at the bottom of the email. So you might hear people referring to an attachment in an email and then you don't see an, an attachment in your email software. There's no evidence of an attachment. So just beware of that when you're looking at these lists. It will be a link at the bottom of the page and it will tell you the file name that was linked to. So it'll be, you know, PDF or whatever the, the file format was. And um, that that's just in case you run into that problem. Um, but yeah, it's a, the, the, the key thing about this is that you, you have a record of all of the past conversations, which is very, very useful for someone who might be coming into this later, who hasn't been in it from the start. They can see what kinds of things were discussed prior to, um, prior to asking questions uh, that might have already been discussed um, and, and conclusions reached prior to them taking part. So it gives them a chance to get up to speed with where a particular group of people are. Um, without having to uh, without having to take up a lot of time of the people who are working hard already uh, to get them up to speed. So, so, so Randy asked a very good question in the chat. Uh, you know, are these secret groups in the OERU, um, and which is a perfectly relevant question. So, the answer to that question is um, no. We do not work uh, in closed. Uh, we are an open, transparent organization. So. Uh, when setting up, the only way to hide a test uh, forum uh, from public view is to, um, you know, put it in a secret group. But there are one or two secret groups. Um, they're not secret in the sense that they're secret, you know, it's an OERU secret group. But there are communications with the vice chancellors group who have requested uh, that communication channel. Um, and so that's what those communication channels are. So, Randy... I hope that uh, satisfies uh, your needs for transparency. Yeah, the, just just be aware that um, when you have your, the emails that you send to these open lists are potentially indexed by Google and various other search engines. So I think one of the reasons for having a secret group is so that the archives are not visible. And the same is true of a private group is so that the archives are not visible to someone who's not a member of the group, which in some cases, in some sort of types of lists might uh, if, if people know that the results of, or the, the content that they're sending to a list is going to be potentially on the public record, they might be reluctant to say things that are important in a particular context. So that's why there's the flexibility of having public and even secret groups to avoid, um, to avoid imposing uh, the, the, the burden of, of public record on, on people who might want to discuss, discuss difficult uh, issues. Um. Thank you, and Dave. Uh, just, I just find it very amusing that I would be able to see the existence of a group. <laughs> That's well, no, uh, you, you, you're only seeing it because you're looking at, at Wayne's view of it. If you were looking at it with your own view of it, you probably wouldn't see that it's secret. It's just the fact that Wayne is showing his uh, his view um, in his browser, in his screen share. Yep. So, so Randy, my, my secret group with you is not showing. <laughs> yeah. Right, move, moving on then. What, what I'd be key, are, are there any other questions related to the, the, the technology we're using? Right, so I, I'll set up, um, Gail, I still need to set up your, your planning pages, which I'll get done for you and get your Kanban up and running. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. Uh, but other than that... No I, rush, no rush. <laughs> I think I've got all, all, all the other things, uh, all the other groups set up. Uh, so Wayne, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, I'm part of today as a guest, right? I'm not actually enrolled in the DS4 OER course. Which, which is uh, absolutely fine. Uh, one of the key philosophies of the OERU is no learner should be denied or no individual should be denied access to seeing any of our course resources. Sure, uh, sure. So, and then so it's, a good, it's a good point. <laughs> yeah. so, so the interesting thing is the DS4 OER course is in fact uh, all about uh, how we plan and develop courses in OERU. So the course is about collaborative development of uh, sort of OER courses. And a bunch of things that you're going to need to know about when assembling the Psych 1 course are actually covered in the course materials. Okay. 
So uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, I suggest it come along because then you can see the documentation we're using and it will, you know, it's just uh, flatten out that learning curve. Uh, and I noticed you started last week, so I'm wondering, maybe I should just join. Is it not too late to join? Oh, you must well, yeah, absolutely. If you, you're most welcome to join. Okay, and, I'll just do that. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, I'm enjoying these conversations. Cool. So, uh, move, uh, moving on forward then, uh, I just want to quickly run through where the course is going now. The, the next uh, session, and again, this is a time zone issue, it was yesterday for New Zealand, it will be today for the Northern Hemisphere, the folk in uh, US and Canada, is about out outlining a course. Um, and that's a key piece of this puzzle because that outline is the, the page that's actually used to generate the course sites. And, and there's just a couple of tweaks that you need uh, to know about. Uh, let's try and find an example of where I've got one open. Oh, here we go. So uh, an outline is really just a structured bullet list. It, there's a couple of rules here. The first bullet will always be the landing page, the home page of the, the course site that you're develop, uh, developing. So you'll see, for example, I clicked on that link, you'll see that it's the home page. Uh, of the, the, the course site, where you know, the landing page. So in the outline, the first bullet will always be the landing page of the course. The other rule with the first bullet in this list is it must always be a link. So in other words, it must link to a wiki page, right? Uh, so the next rule is we break the first rule. <laughs> and, and, and what that is, is... Um, any subsequent bullet uh, which has children cannot be a link. I'll explain this in a moment. It will make sense. It will make perfect sense of, uh, to you uh, in a while. But you'll see that these uh, ones here, these examples, startup, course guide, interactions, webinars, are in fact the high-level navigation of a course. Startup, course line interactions, learning pathways. And you'll appreciate that the landing page is actually not one of those items in the main navigation. So that's why it's different, right? The other reason why, and it's just the way we've implemented the script, we, we could accommodate this feature in the future, but for now, we've just taken a decision that uh, these first level high uh, navigation items are not links because uh, a link is something that is different from the navigation in the course. Uh, by way of example, that item, their syllabus in the drop down menu, does not link to an external website. And you must appreciate that, you know, in a wiki, um, you know, any of these things could potentially be, you know, links. So to keep it simple, we've narrowed the degrees of freedom and basically just said, uh, Anything that has a child, in other words, a sub page, is not a link. So that's uh, except for the first rule. <laughs> and that's basically uh, what we need to know. If I go into the edit source, you'll see that we, uh, we support three hierarchical levels of navigation. Right? First level is one bullet. Second level is two bullets. Third level is three bullets. We don't support more than three hierarchical uh, levels of navigation, and that's by design. Any, in, anybody that has had experience of learning design will know that 14 hierarchical levels is not conducive to uh, a good learning. Um, and that's basically it. You'll see when we get into the learning pathways, we actually got three levels here, level one, level two, level three, right? And uh, the rule applies here, anything that has a child, so orientation is a child of learning pathways, but it has children, so it's not a link. So I just want to point that out by way of introduction. Uh, it will make sense as you start building. If you do make a mistake and make a thing a link that shouldn't be a link, it will become obvious. You won't break anything. Uh, but, you know, when you produce a site, it's not going to work. Or when somebody looks at the page, you'll see, oh, okay, uh, we can just fix that. But I just want to point that out in the beginning. 
which you know the levels and which of these things are links are, are important for the script to understand. And one of the other differences in this course uh, for each uh, participant this year, as well as our OERU partners, we will host the WordPress site uh, on our servers and our technology, so you don't have to worry about setting up any of that tech for the duration of the course. Uh, but there is also an alternative. If you wanted to run your own domain and host your own uh, WordPress site, we do have instructions uh, in, in setting up one of these things in the cloud. Uh, the instructions we provide is, uh, are, is for OpenShift, uh, which is a cloud service provided by Red Hat Linux. So you, uh, the, the philosophy here is that every learner should be able to host and produce their own website if they wanted to. Uh, but in this particular course, you are not expected to do that. Um, we will set up a, a hosted instance for you, which would make life a lot easier. And at the point where this is in session nine, it's looking a little bit ahead to, uh, to the final session. But to produce the actual website, you will be a little widget on your page that if you, you, know, you click it, you put in the URL for your, uh, where your course site resides that we're hosting for you. You enter your username and password, which we will you know, uh, set up, um, and then it will actually run the script to uh, publish the, the course website for you. Uh, Wayne, I wanted just to ask you, I'm, I'm a little confused. Um, just going back to that, that link, non-link, digital scales for collaborative OER, you said it's a link, it's a link. link. But then the other one, ones are also linked. So I, I don't I don't understand what you're getting at. Oh, well, all I'm saying is the first bullet must be a link to the home page, right? It's a rule, okay? And then the subsequent bullets, if any bullet has a sub page, right, it's not a link. So that startup is actually, it might not be displaying that well on the screen with our screen sharing, but that startup is actually not a link, but the ones that are below it are. Um, however, if you uh, are worried that you might not remember this all, it, it is documented quite clearly in the, um, the learning materials. So there is a detailed record of, you know, and summary of, um, these things, I just I want to see if I found. So here it is, is it this page? No, it's not this page. I just don't really recall where it uh, it resides. Maybe it's here. But it, it's actually in the course materials. Uh, it's maybe the next page. I just didn't bookmark that page. Oh, here we go. What? So so here all every everything that I've been talking about in terms of these links and how this thing is set up, it's in the course materials. Uh, Wayne, I have a question. So the, the links, each link links to a page, correct? A page, correct. you're calling each, we link out to an assignment one or whatever, that's a page. In the wiki. Uh, Will a link ever link to several pages, or each link is one page? Uh, each link is always one page in, uh, in this implementation, correct. OK. OK, so our task, once we get into our courses, will be to decide how we want to what content we want to go on each page. Correct. And, and we'll make the link to the page, but the work will be all these pages. So we figure it out, and then the work is actually, let's work on the page that that link is taking us to. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so, and the advantage of this model is, I'm just, if, if we could build, uh, it would be a simple exercise, for example, uh, to take the art appreciation and techniques course, right? Yep. And build an outline because they, all the pages of that course already exist. Yes. Uh, which means then you just click that button and we can produce a flash looking website yep. for the art appreciation and techniques course. Yeah. Uh, we can go backward. Yep. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. 
And again, that, that, that's a very good example of the flexibility of the wiki. So all that work that we have already done on art appreciation and techniques before this improvement was implemented is not lost. Um, so I, yeah, I, just, I just want to make that connection. So for the others that are listening, Gail has worked on a previous course, uh, art appreciation techniques. It was one of the very first prototype courses. And uh, at that stage, we didn't have an elegant solution uh, for publishing these independent websites yet. Um, and so I'm just making that connection. Just, just to clarify also one thing for you, Gail, Dave here. Um, just, uh, there's no reason that each of those links that, that point in turn to individual wiki pages, that those wiki pages that are pointed to could also have links to further wiki pages if it turns out that you don't, for example, want to put all of the content for one page in a single blob. If you wanted to break it down into a further hierarchy, that's fine. The, the key thing is to avoid, um, the key thing is to, uh, we don't want to clutter up the uh, structure of the, of the site with too many levels of hierarchy of information. Okay, that, that is what I was clarifying because I could see a particular topic being too much and it'll be a big long blob, but we don't need to put it in the outline. However, once you link to that page, you could have sub pages. So that, that's good news. Okay, I got Correct. that. Yeah, got and, that. And, and Gail, given your design background, you know this is really the art of chunking. Uh, yes. A, a, you know, a learning pathway into its individual pages. And that's yeah. the art of design is, you know, to figure out, oh, okay, what's the best way to, um, you know, set up the design. Yeah. But by defining this, um, by defining this convention for structuring materials, we're trying to find a, a lowest common denominator that then allows us to mechanically or um, computationally convert the information in a, in a known structure into a coherent site. So what, I mean, if you're interested in those kinds of things, which I would imagine most folk attending today will not be interested. But one of the things we have to think about very carefully at the OERU is the ability to reuse this content in your local learning management system, right? So that we can have what we call open boundary courses where you've got this open free version that is for the free learners, right? But that those same materials are reused on campus for your full fee, full time, face to face students having that online environment or the online environment. So what we've done technically here is we've actually split out the uh, navigation of an individual learning sequence from the global navigation of the site. So this, uh, you know, you can, we can go to any, say, let's say a learning pathway which is developing a storyboard. You might want in your Moodle or your Blackboard or whatever technology you're running locally to integrate that learning pathway sequence uh, in a particular topic or section in your learning management system. And this makes it now relatively trivial for us to be able to export one source of content to multiple delivery platforms. Um, but that's getting a bit technical now. Um, but it's uh, one of the big advantages we've got with the wiki. So we've got one central version control um, that is relatively easy for non-technical people to edit um, that we can reuse in multiple contexts. And so that's the reason you know, why we're you know, going to this effort in marking up this content in ways that we can manipulate at a technical level. No, um, I, I can see that you know, as the content is being developed using the way, I could see how the quality assurance could be accelerated. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's really, really cool. Instead of waiting till the, till the end, the QA folks can, can go in and, and you know, uh, 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 review, make suggestions about uh, uh, component of, of, of course you know um, yeah. Um, yeah very cool very cool yeah now, th thanks for that Randy and that in fact I think is one of the key differences between our open development model and traditional 
e-learning production models because you know in a traditional context you'll have your subject matter experts and then it you know goes along a production line to the learning designers and the quality so it's you know that production line model whereas this model is anybody at any time can actually come in so you can have your QA people working on stuff before it's even finished you, you, and because we've got this detailed version history, we, we can do all this stuff. So that's that's what makes this environment so powerful. Yeah. Okay. So so what I want want to do is just by way of wrapping up, just give a, a just a, a sort of a bird's overview of where we're going. So th the next uh, sessions in this course are really components uh, for actually building learning pathways. So we start off by giving, saying, well, this is how an outline works. You can sequence and chunk your material based on your, your thinking uh, derived from the storyboard. And um, then we move forward into uh, these, uh, a series of uh, digital learning skill challenges. And, and these challenges are really the building blocks of the individual pages that we are authoring. So it starts with things, well, how do I, you know, find and source images of the right licenses and upload them to my pages? How can I remix an existing diagram, which might be a, a graphic overview of the, the, the learning pathway or the course I'm building? How do I go about, uh, you know, remixing a video that I want to integrate into the course? How do I insert the pedagogical templates on the individual pages? So all these components over the next couple of days from basically today uh, New Zealand time through to Tuesday next week are the individual skills components for actually building the individual pages of the course outline. And again, you know, given that this is a wiki, all your outlines um, sh uh, will be linked from your, your main planning page. So, in, I mean, you can actually go to the, the outline of the DS for OER course and actually see how it was put together. So, it's with the, this outline I'm using. Um, but because the outline page is linked from the planning page of each of our projects, any one of us can actually go in and have a look and help fix something that's broken. And so, having this consistency of having a central planning page and it links to a, a, an outline sub page means. I can help uh, Randy if something's, you know, if, if he's got the ring, link in the wrong place, right? I can quickly go in, fix it up, and we're, we're away. And similarly, um, it's interesting, I find folk reporting uh, broken links. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in the code, there's one or two links I, I put the wrong URL in, and I get these messages, oh, the link is broken, the link is broken, and I'm sitting thinking, well, you can actually fix the link. <laughs> Yeah, you know, go to the page and edit it. <laughs> but um, you know, that's the the uh, the power of this model. But you know, it also takes a bit of a while to for folk to get their heads around it. That's basically what I wanted to cover today. I'm 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 weary of the fact that I've gone a couple of minutes over from the scheduled time, so I apologise for that. But if there are any questions from uh, any colleagues, uh, I'm more than happy uh, to respond. I have a quick question. Wayne, um, can you uh, can you instruct where? Maybe I mean it's possible I missed this in the uh, in the course materials actually, but can you instruct us where we should be putting our outlines so that perhaps they can all be linked to from the course related wiki page somehow? So, so, so for so the con the convention we're using is that each mm -hmm. course or each resource that is being developed. I mean, you see, why I'm saying resources, some people aren't developing full courses, right? Mm -hmm. But for each project, let's put it that way, there will be a planning page. In the course materials, there are instructions of how to set up the planning page, but it is essentially a page in the wiki. So in yeah. this, you know, um, let's look at one here. So he has, uh, he has a course project, which is creating sustainable futures. The planning page is a page in the wiki. And then all the uh, sub pages and planning documents are linked as sub pages from the planning page. So the outline is a sub page of the planning page. The design blueprint is a sub page of the main planning page. 
Does that answer your question, Dave? Sure. Well, I'm just I'm just wondering. Like, yeah. I, I have I have um, a bit of a laggard and haven't started my design blueprint here. But I want to I want to just decide. Do I just invent a do I just invent a URL like the creating underscore plant sustainable underscore futures uh, and then start working on that page as the starting point for the course? You, uh, so, you, have, you have total freedom to do that, Dave. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> just making sure because it may be that other people are in a similar situation because I haven't yeah. found any other any of the other yeah. blueprints. So, yeah, um, I, so I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Okay, and so, so I'm um, just but, but, but it is, it's, it's a relevant question, Dave. You know, if, if, if somebody's not sure, um, you know, they can create the page, and you know, in the wiki we can move it. You know, if it's been created in the wrong place, for you know, you know, by way of example, we can move it to the right place. Uh, that's that's easy, it's easily done. However, in the case, the folk that are attending this session, I think just about everybody except yourself and Lenora. Uh, are not working <laughs> on, on, on a full project, a full course project. Okay. But uh, for the folk that might be watching this later, I, I, I think it's a relevant question, yeah. Great. So, uh, Wayne, the intro site course is not linked currently to the course uh, planning page, right? Uh, we do have a page for the intro site. Uh, I set it up last night. Uh, that's why you might not uh, have seen it yet. Okay. Uh, because uh, here we go, intro to psychology. I'll, I'll I'll send you the link. I think you should have received a couple of emails. Sure, I'll go check them out. Yeah. Um, but here it is. Here's the intro to psych course. So what so what I've done, yeah, Fahad, I've uh, I've assumed what the development schedule would look like, uh, but because we mm -hmm. haven't had that conversation in terms of what dates are you know suitable to the folk that are developing the course, um, you, you might want to you know change those dates to you know fit your, your schedule and you know, have that conversation with Rajiv. I don't know how you want to divide up the work. I, I don't know if you're wanting to work, uh, each, you know, each of you take on a learning pathway or each of you go right. work a module. I mean, I, I, I don't know that stuff. So right. that's a conversation you need to have with uh, Rajiv, right? For sure. And, and, and you'll see here I've got question marks. And yep. you'll see here I forgot to remove Carol there, but Carol's not involved in your project. Right. But that we, that we can just edit and fix up. Okay. And so here's a here's a design blueprint page. So I've I pre-populated this for you. Okay. So you, you've got a you know a, a bunch of things to get started there, right? Right. So what we what we're looking for now is I mean this is subject matter expertise stuff. Um, yeah. You guys need to have a think about the aims for each of the micro courses, right? Right. And then together we'll work on this blueprint and um, yeah. Great, great, thank you. And so ideally what I'm hoping each of our project developments will be able to achieve by the end of this course, which runs till the end of March, is a draft of a design blueprint completed and at least one or possibly two learning pathways. Because by actually uh, setting up a, a single learning pathway, we will encounter most of the problems you're likely to encounter with the full development. And we, you know, we, we, can, we can get the result uh, over the next couple of weeks. Right. Wow, Dave, you can type. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out who was doing the typing. Sorry, sorry about sorry about that. What you didn't hear was that most of that typing was the backspace key when I messed something up. So, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, in my case, that would be accompanied by swearing. So you did well. I've learned to do that under my breath because I can never remember whether I'm my, my mic is on or not. Uh, Christine Cameron, have uh, have I covered any any of the questions you had? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I think that it makes the process from here on a little bit clearer for me. And I'm, I appreciate looking at some of the tools that we're looking at and seeing where the examples are located so that I can, um, yeah. You know, it's good. It was very uh, clarifying to listen to you. Okay. Uh, Wayne, one quick question. So at Open Learning, what we call a blueprint has an alignment of outcomes to assessments. 
which of all the documents has that kind of alignment? Is it this one right here we're looking at? So, so it would it would be the blueprint. So, in the uh, the assessment strategy, right section, we we would typically then do uh, that. We'd have that sort of conversation where the, we have the alignment of the learning outcomes with the assessment strategy. Um, but each course will be different, right? Um, and it, because in this particular case, uh, the uh, corporate communication course will be ex assessed externally. <clears throat> so we've got to think about the formative evaluation as opposed to the summative evaluation. Um, and But that's a conversation we can have. I can put you in touch with yeah. the folk at uh, Thomas Edison State University who have more knowledge about the, the assessments. The, that particular course, I believe, is also uh, has a CLEP exam. So yeah, I mean, even if you had a had a had a chat with uh, some of the folk in the PLAS section, um, they would be able to give you some pointers. And if you go to the CLEP website, I believe they actually have the the detailed outcomes uh, for the CLEP assessments. So that information yeah. is available. Yeah. Yeah, I've checked that, but but that's not what I was getting at. Um, one suggestion I would make to everybody. It's not, it's not okay or it's not enough to list outcomes on top and then later on list some assessments, which is your typical university kind of course outline where people yes. have outcomes, they have assessments. What is missing very often is a very careful alignment of the assessment with the outcome side by side. So that's how we blueprint. We blueprint is every outcome being met in some assessment or is every assessment, yep. which outcomes is it covering? And that kind of alignment, alignment. is something I'm yeah. suggesting everybody needs to be careful about. Yep. Because uh, very often any course you pick up in a university has yep. a outcomes at the top and later on it has assessments. But if you do a careful checking, sometimes some outcomes are nowhere to be found in the assessment and vice versa. And, so and I'm just I, throwing that out. If I can amplify that. Your alignment. If I can amplify that, we've done, I did a lot of work at Lincoln um, where you'd get <laughs> and look at a course that someone had been teaching for a while and there'd be a head slap moment and they'd realize that they weren't teaching something they assessed and they were kind of like, oh, that's why everybody failed that bit of the exam. I wondered, and, and it, it, I'd, I'd love to pretend it wasn't common. Uh, Gail, Gail, would you have like, like an example that you could share with us of a best practice? Pra right. Good pra practice. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, you can know, see where, where you, know, you know, that you're, you're thinking of. Um, I th that would be quite, u quite useful. Yeah. Okay. I can share that with everybody. Yeah. So, so Gail, uh, share me a link as well. I've, I've got an idea that I can actually uh, generate an, an automated table that has got a form where people can put the outcome and then click a button and then a line assessment they've got in mind. So I can build a template for that. I mean, I think it's an excellent suggestion. So let's yeah. use the power of the wiki just to build a little tool to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty simple because if you number your outcomes, say one to nine, when you do your assessments, I make the subject matter experts tell me assessment one is covering one and five. Assessment number two, we double check that all outcomes are covered in all assessments. So yeah. it's that kind of alignment, yeah. It's a it's good recommendation. Let, okay. Let's implement it. Okay. Uh, can, can I ask a question uh, quickly about um, People creating their course outlines. Um, Wayne, perhaps there's something uh, here that you've already come up with for this. I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but I'm just wondering if I was to create a template for a course outline which strips out all but the, the various conventional headings and makes it easy for someone to copy and paste the text, the source text from 
from a, a sort of a test page and put it into whatever editor they feel most comfortable using, be it um, Notepad or Sublime or um, Vim or even Microsoft Word, and then they can search and replace a few tokens that I put in place, and then they can flesh, they can use that as a quicker way of fleshing out um, their own course outline. Would that be, would that actually be uh, useful to anyone, or is that is that is there something else that already provides that basic capability? Uh, okay, a quick response. Yes, I think that would be useful for folk that are working on OERU developments because we're going to have a pretty standard layout. We decided at the previous mm -hmm. meeting that uh, each OERU course will have the startup section, it will have the interactions, and we were using learning pathways. So there are a couple of generic features we've kind of agreed on for consistency. So mm -hmm. the response would be yes, that would be possible. What we can actually do is the, the wiki actually has a capability of doing an, uh, an input form and to pre-populate yeah, yeah, yeah. wiki text for targets. Um, so we, we could do one of those. Uh, but I mean, we can figure out the technical detail for maybe simplifying it. But where, sure. where, the, where the challenge comes in is when folks start wanting to design something that doesn't fit sort of the OERU template. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there's that trade-off, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking that if someone is creating their own course now, they have to they have to go in and effectively pick an existing outline, like the outline, the course outline, and the course outline two that you provided, and they have to go in and they have to change, they have to work out how to change all that text themselves and create their own page links and so on. Um, and I'm just thinking that there might be a way of, of speeding that process up. But um, anyway, we can talk about that outside of this meeting, perhaps. Yep, we can have that conversation, Dave. I think. I mean, I think, I think it's a good idea. Anything we can do to make yes, lives yes. easier hmm. for uh, folks that are working on OERU courses, you know, we should do it. Eh? I'm in a meeting. Yep. I'm in a meeting with Wayne at the moment. Okay, I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Any additional questions? Sounds good. Sounds good to me. The, the so I mean, just uh, the final quest question I have uh, was the was the moon development. Sorry, sorry, the moon sailor. Oh yes, sorry. My apologies, Randy. I clean forgot. Um, so a, a number of our projects uh, are based on converting existing sailor courses, right? So, so what I've done is I've, I've had a conversation with colleagues at the Sailor Foundation who have built all their courses using Moodle, whether they would share with us the backup, the Moodle backups of those courses, uh, which they have done. Uh, we will have a look at doing an initial uh, scripting to convert the content into wiki format, right? Into a wiki syntax format. So sort of the basic, you know, layout, layout, bold, italics, basic text formatting, <coughs> that sort of thing. We, we, we will f find a solution for an initial wiki text version of that. What will be harder to do is the, how you break up the, the, those courses into uh, sub pages. Uh, so, for example, just a very practical example, the sailor courses divide the smallest unit of learning and they, and they call them units, whereas in the OERU we talk about learning pathways, right? And, and, and so that's not something that is that easy to convert because as, as a learning designer you need to decide on the optimal structure of the individual learning sequence. But what we will be able to generate is kind of a, a bunch of wiki pages somewhere where you will be able to cut and paste the wiki text into the new course outline that you're developing, if that makes sense. Uh, what is also harder to implement is uh, if they've got embedded images, we, we need to do an analysis of what, what's the best way to actually uh, do that conversion. Um, so we'll look at the most economical way of doing a conversion from that Moodle backup, right? Uh, in a way that will minimize our work in, this, in terms of assembling that course, uh, taking sort of a best fit solution into account. 
And so part of that depends on the, if some courses have got, uh, you know, high amount of uh, images and video, we might want to use a different uh, strategy for doing that conversion. But uh, we will look into that and um, should have an answer, you know, within the next fortnight or so of how that's going to work here. Yeah. Um, thanks, Wayne. I have one other question, and this is this is a uh, 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 maybe as we get into really working the the, um, uh, the, the content, the learning pathways. Um, a really time-consuming piece of course, course development, searching for images. Okay. And oftentimes, oftentimes, when you search for images, you come across some images that, that may not have relevance. It might, might be a number two choice for me, but it could be a number one, number one for somebody in the, man, the management course or in, in psychology, which save time for my colleagues. Right? We all want to help, help each other. Right? So have... Has there, has there been thinking about how we can coordinate in some way that, that level of effort? So it, it, I just put it out, out there because it's really, really time consuming to go hunting for images. For images. And if I, like I say, if I come across an image, image that I think might, might have merit, a quick scan of, say, the management course and see what learning pathways are, are Ah, oh, this might be a really good really issue for them. Well, saves them time. So, and similarly. So, I put that out there. Oh, that's, uh, Randy, that's an, well, that's an excellent suggestion. So, um, the one of two ways we can do it. If, if somebody actually physically uploads the image, what would be a good way of doing this is to actually tag it with, say, the MVP tag. We're going to set up a category for, for MVP so that all MVP images are easily found. Uh, another solution, Dave, Dave and I might need to have an offline conversation here. He's uh, been working on a tool called the Resource Bank. And Dave, that might be something, you know, if somebody finds an image, they can just share the URL, right? And we can maybe figure out an, an easy way to implement something like that. But I think it's an excellent suggestion, Randy. Um, mm -hmm. It would be extremely helpful, you know, it's, it's sort of networking across the teams. I really like the idea, yeah. Yep, that sounds uh, that sounds like a good idea. That's uh, yeah, the, the resource bank concept is is designed or is intended to meet that kind of a need. Although we may need something that can be more easily bound to a particular um, course directly. So yeah, we'll have to talk about that. I think, but yes, that's a good idea. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Randy, we'll have that conversation, and we will share the outcome of uh, solutions and suggestions on the main MVP uh, group list, uh, of which you are a member. So thanks for that. I think it's an excellent idea, yeah. Colleagues, I think we're just about done. Uh, I, I will post a recording of, of, of the video for you know, folk who were unable to make it. And um, look forward to seeing you online. And hey, if any questions, uh, don't hesitate to part, you know, post on any of the lists or uh, if you prefer Twitter or you know, microblogging. Uh, we're here to help the, the other, um, and, 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 and I think Randy has made use of this already. We do have a, a sort of a 24, well, it's not 20, quite 24 hours, uh, even though the foundation does keep odd hours. Um, you would... Uh, <laughs> find uh, it's a good chance you'd find uh, some of us most of the time on our chat.oeru.org uh, and uh, Randy we have improved the the registration loop there we hadn't implemented the technology in the best way to facilitate um, you know easy access but what this is is chat.oeru.org if you, you know, got an immediate pressing question you know just log in here and, and post it and there's a good chance that one, one of the team will be there to be able to respond. Um, so that's uh, for immediate, uh, immediate responses, yep. If anyone has used Slack before, um, if they've ever come across a tool called Slack, it's quite a, it's quite a uh, poster child or, or a, um, 
uh, it's it's a bit of a fad at the moment. Um, but anyway, this is an open source alternative to Slack, the same way that plan that our plan.oer.org is an open source alternative to to Trello. Okay. So that gives you an idea if you're familiar with any, either of those two two tools. It gives you an idea of the kind of purpose that these tools have. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. I'm gonna sign off. Yeah. So goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Good night. See you later. Bye-bye. Have a good week.